Hey, welcome back everyone. I'm going to finish up the last section of the inductor notes. Remember an inductor is just a solenoid in a circuit, sometimes with a metal core so that accentuates the effect, a ferromagnetic core. So we're going to look at the behavior of uh, RL, LC, and might just talk about RLC circuits uh, just a smidge. So we've got this uh, picture at the right, uh, battery, resistor, inductor, all in series, very basic, switch is closed at time t equals zero. Think about what's going to happen here. Now, if it was just the resistor and the battery, circuit would immediate, uh, current would immediately start flowing and the current would be uh, V over R. But an inductor develops a uh, voltage across it when current tries to change. And the current definitely tries to change when you close the switch. So initially, the voltage is going to be across the inductor and it will prevent the current from flowing as quickly as it would. It still starts flowing at time zero, just slowly. So it ramps up over time. You could expect exponential growth that levels off and approaches the asymptote, very similar to a capacitor. But a capacitor does not prevent the flow of electricity at the beginning when it's uncharged. It prevents it when it's charged. Here, this happens anytime you change the current. So there's some similarities and differences you should think about. As we go around the circuit from the battery, Let's just say we start at this point, we'll use Kirchhoff's loop rule. As we go across the battery, we get plus epsilon for our voltage drop. Across the resistor, voltage drops with current, so minus IR. And across the inductor, because the current is going up, the voltage will drop. If the current was going down, this would actually be a voltage gain. The voltage drop would occur against the current when the current goes down. So the current's going up voltage drop here, which is going to be uh, minus LDIDT. And then we're back to our point. So we'll use Kirchhoff's loop rule here at the uh, beginning. And that's it. The battery minus the resistor minus the inductor equals zero. That's a differential equation because it's got I and DIDT. Part B, solve it. First thing we want to do is divide by R. This is going to be the same sort of differential equation we've solved time and time again with drag, with uh, capacitors. Uh, we saw it earlier in the induction section with the uh, bars sliding down in the presence of gravity. We've got it again here. You want to get I by itself positive and then separate variables. So I divided by negative R, that got I by itself and positive. Now I separate my variables. This stuff gets divided down here, I just switch the order so I is first. And then here I multiplied by DT and negative R over L. That is what we need to integrate right there from zero current to some later current I. And on this side, we would go from zero to some later time T. So uh, this has already been uh, evaluated here. I guess I skipped the step where I would have showed the uh, integral after integration before evaluation. You should really show that step. So if you got room in your paper, squeeze that step in here, although this one is a little bit long, so it might be tight, just be space conscious. This goes into that familiar fraction, put each side as a power on E and then solve. You can factor this out. V over R, that's the current that would be flowing if there was no inductor there. And that happens uh, after the switch has been closed for a long time. 
initially at time zero, e to the zero power, one minus one, you have no current. And this is what it looks like. Exponential we approaching this asymptote of epsilon over r. Once we have uh, that current as a function of time, getting the voltage on the resistor is going to be easy because V equals IR. And um, the voltage on the inductor should be pretty easy too because V equals L di dt. And we have I, so all we would need to do is take a derivative. So in part C, V equals IR. When you multiply by R, it canceled out the R that's on the bottom, and you get something similar. The voltage across the resistor starts at zero, which means all the voltages across the, the inductor at the beginning, only for a split second. And then this voltage starts to decay, this one grows, and at the end, all the voltage of the battery is across the resistor. Opposite of a capacitor. A capacitor uh, would start with no voltage across it and would end with all the voltage across it in an RC circuit. Here, the inductor starts with all the voltage and ends with none. Capacitor starts with none and ends with all. That's when the switch is closed and current begins to flow. In part D, the voltage across the inductor LDI dt in magnitude. When you take the derivative here, this first term gives you a zero. The negative out there, those two negatives will cancel, and we end up with positive epsilon e to the negative rt over l. You could have a negative two there if you know if the negative is not important here. We're just talking about magnitudes. So it starts with all the voltage and then goes to none, just like we had discussed a second ago. And then E, describe the circuit after it reaches a steady state with constant current. So you can write this in somewhere down here. <clears throat> I'll just uh, speak about it for a moment and you can summarize. When we have a constant current, di dt is zero. So there's no voltage across the inductor, and it acts like a simple battery resistor circuit. The current would be V over R. The voltage across the battery is the same as the voltage across the resistor. And it acts like the solenoid is not even there. Although the solenoid is storing energy but that's not affecting the behavior of the circuit. But it is storing energy, which is a difference between an RL circuit at steady state versus just a battery and a resistor at steady state. All right, the next problem. Describe the behavior of the circuit at the right during the following periods, from when the switch is closed until a steady state is reached during the period of steady state and from when the switch is opened after a period of steady state until the current stops. Again, I will just kind of discuss these and you can summarize A, B, and C. At the uh, end, I may draw some graphs. You can put the graphs with A, B, and C if you want. I'll see where I draw them along the way. So what happens when the switch is closed? Well, when the switch is closed, the current's changing, and this is going to have all the voltage across it. As current begins to flow, um, and because all the voltage is across, you know, I guess basically the inductor acts like an open switch when you first close the this switch. It doesn't want to let current through. It resists that. So the current will just be going through these two resistors in series. This one would have a voltage drop. This one would have a voltage drop. The voltage drop across this and this would be equal. And over time, 
this is going to start letting more and more current in and the voltage drop across these will drop slowly uh, and then after a long time and now we're getting into part b during a period of steady state current comes up through resistor r now inductor l at steady state this acts like just a wire no voltage drop because no didt zero so no voltage here that means no voltage on the resistor that means no current through the resistor all the currents going through l it just acts like this and that will uh increase the current to some maximum value of epsilon over r so initially current takes the outside branch and it would be uh, epsilon over 2r then this starts to let current through the current through here drops but as this lets current through the current through here increases and it will continue to increase until the current reaches a steady state and then you'll have a current of epsilon over r flowing right through there and no current through the other one after that if you open the switch again the inductor here won't let the current die immediately it keeps pumping the current for a little while and that current will go through the resistor and dissipate as heat or lost energy and eventually it'll just die out and that'll be that there's stored energy in here and so when the switch is open that energy ends up pushing the current a little longer than the battery would have, pushes the current through the resistor and uh, ends up getting wasted as heat. So let me maybe just draw a, uh, a graph uh, for each of these. Okay, so for part A, we would have, if we're gonna draw a current versus time graph, at time zero, the current is going to be epsilon over 2R. It will reach a maximum value of, oops, that's not epsilon. It'll reach a maximum value of epsilon over R over a long amount of time. So it starts there and then it lets off. For letter B, if I was going to draw a graph, I, T, epsilon over R, that's it. Not very interesting. And then in part C, if we were going to draw a graph, I, T, We'd again have a, uh, a starting point of epsilon over R. It has to start there because that's where that's, this graph will end. And this graph, the graph in C picks up where the graph in B lets off. This is going to die out over time and go to zero. Zero, zero, zero. So that's just graphs of the uh, current. You could also do graphs of the voltages across either of the resistors. You could graph the voltage across the inductor. Um, lots of different things. We'll look at some of those uh, in class. And then our last uh, problem here, an LC circuit. So we've got a, a capacitor and an inductor and a switch. The capacitor, the capacitor starts fully charged uh, to its initial voltage, and then we close the switch. What happens? Well, the inductor has uh, will resist changes in current, and an inductor can also store energy. 
So when the switch is closed, the charge begins to flow off the capacitor and it flows through the inductor. As it flows through the inductor, the inductor one slows it down so it doesn't happen as fast as it would through, as say like a capacitor through a resistor. The inductor is gonna slow it down and the inductor stores the energy. It doesn't dissipate the energy as heat. So the energy gets transferred from the capacitor to the inductor. But when the current reaches zero, which means the capacitor is fully discharged, the inductor has energy stored up into, in it. And it's gonna release that energy in the form of an induced current. And then when that goes back to the capacitor, it cycles back and forth and back and forth. I shouldn't say when the, uh, when the current in the inductor reaches zero, but when the current in the inductor becomes steady, right? The capacitor starts to discharge. There's an increase in current to begin with. At some point, that current is going to level off and become steady. And then at that point, the inductor has the energy. And as the current starts to decrease, the inductor starts pumping current again. And it cycles back and forth like that. So write a differential equation that relates the charge and the time in terms of uh, L and C. So capacitor starts uh, with plus and minus charges on it. Those mm -hmm. plus charges flow around this way. So we have a voltage drop across the inductor because the current is in this direction and it is increasing. So voltage drop here and the capacitor has a voltage gain here. This is just saying that the voltage across the capacitor is the same as the voltage across the inductor, which has to be because they are directly connected. So in part A, we have C is Q over V and the voltage for the inductor is negative L di dt. Di dt is the derivative of current, but current is dq dt. So this is actually the second derivative of current with or of charge over time. And when you combine this equation with CV equals Q, you get this negative CL T squared Q DT equals Q. And that is a function of time. Q is a function of time, and it's a second order differential equation. We haven't seen this before. We would have seen it uh, if we had got all the way through oscillations. But that being said, when you think about this, it's not a hard one to solve. What function because that's what we need to find, a function for Q. What kind of function would represent something where you take the second derivative of that function and you get negative of the function itself? That's what this all here is saying. I could move this negative CL to the other side and it would say the second derivative of a function is equal to negative the function itself. So what function represents that? Well, it could be a sine function. Now with a sine function, if you're gonna use this to represent um, the charge here, we have some starting charge, Q0, and inside here, we'd have some constant and time. The other thing that could work would be a cosine function. Again, with an omega t inside. We're going to use the cosine version of this because when t is zero, the capacitor is charged. And when you put zero into cosine, you get a charge on the capacitor, a charge of q zero, the initial amount. So this is the differential equation that we have here. And uh, let me I'm 
going to take him and, uh, well, I th I'll do it this way. I was thinking of rearranging it, but uh, I'll just go ahead and do it this way. So we're going to take this function right here and put it into both sides of this equation. All right, so I'm going to get on the right side, Q naught cosine omega t. On the left side, I need to take the second derivative of Q naught cosine omega t. I still have the negative CL out front. The second derivative of cosine is a negative cosine. I have the Q naught, and I'm going to get an omega squared, because each time you take a derivative, you also take the derivative of the stuff on the inside, and that's going to give you an omega, and then another omega. And then we have cosine omega t. Now, if you look at what happens out front here, those uh, negatives cancel off. And what else is the same between the left and the right? Well, Q naught's the same. Cosine of, cosine of omega t is the same. And what are we lo really left with here? On the left side, I have a negative CL Oh, it wasn't negative. We canceled that out. A CL omega squared equals 1. Because we canceled out everything on the right. That tells us that omega equals 1 over the square root of CL. It's called the angular frequency. It's not the same as angular velocity. And it would uh, relate to the uh, period. How frequently things cycle back and forth. All right, 2 pi over omega gives you the period for this sine or cosine function. All right, so it's a sine and cosine, right? So how do we interpret the sine and cosine here? Well, all the charge starts here, and then the charge flows over here, and then it flows back over here, and then back over there, and then back over there, and then back over there, and then back, there, and then back and forth. Actually, I think a more accurate way to say it is that the charge goes through here, and then this keeps pumping it, and then the charge accumulates over on this side. And then it goes this way, and this keeps pumping it, and then it accumulates over here. So part B um, was to solve the differential equation, which we just did, state the solution Q of t, which we have at the bottom, and then V of t and I of t, and that's what we'll do here. So Q of t... This is what we just came up with. And instead of cosine of omega t, I put cosine of t over the square root of CL. And I have C V naught here, because for a capacitor, Q, C equals Q over V, so Q equals C V. So that's all I did. I, I replaced that in terms of the, uh, the given uh, quantities, basically. Right, because Q naught wasn't given, but V naught and C were. Velocity is a uh, function of time. You take Q and divide by C to get V. So the C cancels, and we have another cosine. And then for current as a function of time, dQ dt, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and you end up. Uh, multiplying by 1 over the square root of CL. Oh, and I still have my C there. That shouldn't be the case, right? Oh, D, no, DQ, DT? Yeah, that C should be there. What was I thinking? All right, part C. Describe the behavior of the circuit over time and whether this is actually possible. All right, I'm just gonna talk about part C. You can uh, write about it. So the cosine function uh, alternates, it swings between one and negative one, right? So if you think of this as the charge on the capacitor as a function of time, if, if this is plus 
Q0 to start with, and it swings over a function of time, it's going to go from plus Q, and then later on, this side's going to become minus Q, and then later on, this side's going to become plus Q. So the charge flows off the capacitor through the inductor. The inductor keeps pushing it beyond what it would normally want to, and then the plus charge congregates over here, at which point it begins to flow backwards, and the inductor pushes it, and it congregates over here, and it just cycles back and forth and back and forth. And the energy also cycles back and forth. Sometimes all the energy is on the capacitor. Sometimes the energy is in the inductor. And then for D, the maximum uh, current. Well, the maximum current would be this stuff out in front because you want to maximize sine. That becomes one. So this stuff out in front is the max current. We should, in class, if you remind me, do a dimensional analysis of this, just so you can make sure that these crazy units actually come out to be in amps. The total energy is the energy in the inductor plus the energy in the capacitor. And so the energy starts off all in the capacitor, 1 half C V naught squared. The energy in the inductor, 1 half I squared. And the energy in the capacitor, 1 half CV squared. And this would be the voltage across the capacitor, right, at any time. And these, these here would both be sines and cosines, uh, right? I was a sine function. V was a cosine function. Well, when you square a sine or a cosine, it's just going to mean that it's always positive. So that's all. It's just that these have positive amounts of energy in them all the time. And that wraps it up. So hope you learned something. Let me know if you have any questions in class and we'll see you then.